Hello and welcome to the GMBN podcast. Now, we had a fantastic weekend of racing, a weekend so good that it had you feeling as if you now had a true understanding of what the very edge of your seat is indeed made for. The non-end of season world champs threatened to steal the jam out of the Climax's donut, but we were not disappointed. Tracy Hanna's deserved overall win was a joy to behold, and I can personally attest to just how dedicated she is. Loic Bruni replicated a feat seldom achieved as he claimed the double. The release of pressure was so tangible and so great, it could have indeed contributed to the beginnings of an explanation to the extreme fronts of weather the US is experiencing at the moment. The tension between Bruni and Pyrion was thicker than the aforementioned world champ's eyebrows. Just don't let Brendan Faircloth hear, as I hear he's a dab hand with the clippers. In the cross country, Kate Courtney made good on her early season form and managed to bring it home much to the delight of the American fans. With all due respect, I, re- respect, I regret to inform to those listening, our friends across the pond, that if I hear another USA chant, I will probably take a long walk off a short pier. I can only imagine what it must be like to carry that weight of expectation. Personally, I struggle to stick to dinner plans. How these athletes manage to cope with all that pressure whilst also being unwa- unwavering in their quest to be on the limit for a season is amazing to me. Some even manage to do it for their entire career- careers. Nino Scherte seemed to almost be enjoying himself if you can enjoy turning your lungs to pate at one and a half thousand meters elevation above sea level. Maybe he didn't enjoy the puncture so much but he did seem to revel in bringing back Avancini with the rumoured discontent between the pair distilling into something like satisfaction as he reeled him in like a famished fisherman. Second on the day to his powerhouse teammate Lars Forster, but Nino had already taken care of the overall. I have Oli Beckinsale here here with me, and I'm fascinated to hear about his insight on cross-country, team politics, and all-round budgie smuggling. (laughs) I hear the US Customs is an absolute nightmare. But first... The downhill. Amazing. Amazing. It was yeah. absolutely fantastic. I mean, I don't know who I feel happier for, for Tracy or for Loic, but they both seem to really be desperate for it and really, really want it. I mean, it's great. I think cross country and downhill that sometimes you have, they've mixed it around some years. Sometimes you've had the, the final cross country after the world. Sometimes mm-hmm. you had it before. And I think there's risk. If you have it after the world, there can be a real risk of it being a bit of a, a flat weekend. Mm-hmm. If the overall's already decided, yes. everyone's done, the world's is the biggest race, mm-hmm. everyone's peaked mentally, and then the yeah. following week, everyone just goes through the motion. Mm-hmm. But having most of the overalls in the big races still up for grabs, yeah. and in the US World Cup, which I think is, is a good addition to the sea, I think it made it a yeah, fantastic race it down was. the land cross country. And do you think it was, I mean, Loic Bruni is, you know, almost so calculated in his approach to world champs. I don't know if it's a French downhillers thing, but Nico Bullier used to be the same. But we almost saw him slightly rattled, maybe. I don't think we saw the same look that we saw last weekend in terms of his... He didn't seem to just be like, right, this is it, I've got to do it. But even at the bottom, he looked quite sort of frenzied as if he hadn't got the one he wanted. Yeah, I, mean, I think for those guys, oh, yeah. I'm not a downhill race, I'm a cross-country guy, but I think cross-country is easier when you're, race, when you're racing for an overall title. Yes, possibly, yeah. Because you're going head to head and you can see where your competitor's at. Is it mm. good? Is it bad? You can calculate the points as you go. Yeah. So you know, right, I've got them doing by two places. You can actually structure your whole race around that. Yeah. Downhill guys, no chance. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're not true, getting yeah. feeds. They're just doing their race. Yeah. Okay, I've got to finish, you know, top three, mm-hmm. for example. And then, but actually, do I back off a bit? They've got a lot more going on. Yes. About how to push, how to hold back. So I think their guy, their race for overall mm-hmm. is so much pressure, so much complete. Cross country guys have an easy time compared yes. to them. And also I suppose in the cross country, you know, well, Nino you know, Shad's example, you can puncture and still get You've a got strong time. Result. You've got time. You can yeah, yeah. it can all work its way out. Those guys, I mean, they're so close. It's one mistake mm. and they are done. They're at the top ten. Yeah. You know, and it literally are going down. And there's some I mean, I see some of those sections look pretty gnarly to me as a, as a as a fan you know armchair fan at home yeah they scared me and you know they one mistake one clip out and they're done yeah so. and i think you know credit to snowshoe being a new venue on the world i think there's almost kind of approach with a bit of sometimes i think cynicism people are like oh you know just bring back champery go oh, you know get get it done with yeah, but yeah actually it was a fantastic venue i think danny hart said in his interview afterwards that he was walking the track and not really feeling it. But when he rode it, it certainly made a lot of sense. Yeah. Some of those features, though, looked, you know, just jumps that not only incredibly technical and demanding in terms of timing, but also speed. 
that one that you know the people overshooting in practice but yeah i mean i i yes you saw it from the same camera angle i saw it from mm. from the backside and you probably couldn't get how big it was yeah, yeah. or how close the trees were coming mm -hmm. i think but yeah no from as an armchair fan i was yeah blown away by it. Yeah. Like some amazing racing yeah and i am um, personally having worked the tracy with when i was at polygon just so happy for her yeah she is you know, I mean, you can get the idea just talking to her. She just had that kind of intensity about her. Right. But just how much she wanted it. You know, she she would, she does you know, loads of sacrifice and everything is so um, input-output. Yeah. I've got to put the inputs in correctly. And um, I was kind of worried watching her come down. She was up at the first blitz and then kind of falling back. And honestly, Yeah, the I think she got a bit was, tight, didn't she? She, she started did. to be worried in that midsection. Yeah. And then lost a bit of time, but yeah, got which, it done. Which in some ways made Snowshoe the perfect venue for the last race of the season. Yeah. Because it did have that, the closer to the end you got, seemingly, the more places yeah. you could could snag a But I think an overall, uh, someone who wins an overall series, I think you, the Worlds is the biggest race. Mm -hmm. but I think everyone would say, if you're going to win one, you win the Worlds. But in terms of a, getting it right, Team-wise as well, mm -hmm. team, bike, everything's got to be done from, you know, good from March through to September. Yes. So I think it's a bigger achievement yeah, I, in I itself, agree. you know, agree. Yeah, you know you've, yeah. got, you've got to stay up, you've got, you've got to stay upright every week, you've got to stay injury free, mm -hmm. the bike's got to be dialed, so there's more pressure on the mechanics, mm -hmm. there's more pressure on the bike suppliers. Yeah, yeah I think it's a big, uh, you know, it's a big one for those. And you could see how much it meant to everyone. Oh my God, I think there was such a lovely sense of redemption when you saw Mick congratulating Tracy in the finish area after only a few years ago in Cairns, where they were both, when they were both consoling each other, yeah. and there was a nice full circle approach. Yeah, it's nice you see family members there, and yeah. you know, and, and, yeah, it, 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 it was cool. Both races, you know, it's good emotion at the finish, isn't it? Yeah, so. totally. And I think Marine Cabaret will probably go into next season as maybe the the kind of marked. Yeah, she was. I mean, I, the bit, you know, that, that that big double at the back end, mm. you know, and she cleared that one. And yeah. I mean, it's nuts to be able to. I mean, that was cool where the splits are, where they got more splits these days, mm -hmm. and they're so accurate now you know, to be down. Mm. And then almost one double gets you two seconds yes. up because you could carry the momentum into the bottom end. But yeah, I, that was that I, was pretty cool. I don't know if it's a narrative device to build tension on the live stream of that, the indicator that always seems to be wrong. You know, going yeah. down the left hand side, it just builds tension. Oh my God, they're 20 seconds back. Oh no, they're not. Yeah, <laughs> you but you look, I mean, you have to put my, I mean, yeah, the, the split side of it, the tension building up. I mean, yeah, my daughter's 10. She's not a mountain biker. She saw me watching it last night. What are you watching? I said, I've got five to go. Yeah, yeah. And she was like, oh, and she sat down, she was into it, mm. you know, and when Danny went to the end, yeah. she was, she was captivated. And that's, that's a 10 year old yeah. girl yeah. who's not a mountain biker as such, yeah. um, who straight away, because of the, the splits yes. and the tension, was into it. I and, think it was pretty cool. And it's funny, I, like, I watched the Stevie Smith one when he had that showdown with G, I think yeah. at Leo Gang a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago. And... What was in, there was a lot of things to take away from the differences and how much the sport has changed, but not least the number of spectators on the course. Yeah. And it's the same if you watch, uh, you know, I, we're talking the other week after Val de Sol and I was watching some old runs. Yeah, again, from even five, six years ago. Yeah. And now it's like three people deep the whole way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it yeah. wasn't that before. And I think, you know, I think some things like atmosphere and stuff, it's not some, and I'm going to sound a bit kind of arty farty here, but it's not some, you know, <sighs> digital thing you can put numbers on. No. But it's amazing how it, it builds and it transcends as you watch it. Well, I think if anyone's been to Fort William, yeah. you know, that's the head of the game with fans and you mm -hmm. know, everyone gets a lift up, walks away down, and then that tension's building. Yeah. And then the fans at the bottom are building. Yeah. And then when it comes down, when I was lucky enough to be at the bottom the first time PT1, yeah. in that kind of cauldron at the bottom of oh, Fort wow. William. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That were bonkers. You know? Yes. You know, various clips out there and stuff, but you, know, but you can't beat that as sport. Yeah. You know, yes. that's, that's not just cycling whether you're into it or not it doesn't matter who you are if yeah. you're in that bit that's that's proper sport and I always think as well like you know when you get the Premier League footballers who go from scoring in front of 40,000 people week in week out and they retire how they must acclimatise to not getting that amazing hit because it is like a even as a spectator you get it but imagine being what Loic went through that yeah, tension yeah. and release it must be like a drug it must be an absolutely I think, remarkable yeah, that's sensation what I, I think that's why yeah. we could do a whole podcast on it but a lot of sports <laughs> a lot of sports people struggle to stop Yes. You know, and actually yeah. they go in a bit of a bad place for a while. Because I mean, if something... you're used to doing that every, every other week, yeah. you know, walking around Sainsbury's on a Sunday probably don't quite cut it. And I would speak on behalf of the people that struggle to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The cross country race was also fantastic. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it was just, I think, you know, the, you're speaking about the overall, and one thing that World Champs doesn't have is the numbers game. We saw it with where Neff was sitting and where 
Courtney was sitting and then something like Risford's having a puncture and yeah, you think yeah. oh my god because this changed it overall could there be a place in it, it and it was, was a really different circuit for cross country compared to the others it was some people would say well it wasn't the best circuit you know it was a bit fast and a bit short but I like it mm -hmm. and it was different mm. you know so you've got some races I think that's the nice thing with, with different circuits probably more so in cross country and downhill is you've got some that are hillier some that are faster I mean we used to race it's a bit, you know, when I was racing, we used to have a race in Madrid, a mm. World Cup in a park in the centre. It's like being in Hyde Park, bigger <laughs> version of that. Dead flat, dead fast. It was all based off one ridge. Oh, wow. Yeah. But mental. Mm. Going around big groups, big speed, drifting out, massive crowd. But it was just, it was nice to have that one round. Mm. And then the next week you're in Leger or somewhere. Yes. And that's why it was, it was good to see big groups going around. And it's slightly different. It suits different riders. So mm. you get a different mix up of people. Some people are better off following a wheel and being in pain the whole time, more yes. of a cyclocross type yeah, yeah. race. And some people are better off of big <laughs> yeah. climbs, big descents. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's cool. I mean, women's race went off really fast mm -hmm. and it was, obviously you had Neff and Courtney that were, were in battling mm -hmm. for the overall. They both started to give each other a kicking on yes. laps one and two. And as a result, both suffered. Mm -hmm. You know, you saw Neff almost come to a halt. Yeah. And then she recovered really well, but she did herself in in the first couple of laps. Yeah. I don't know whether she felt great on the start and it didn't pace it well or just wasn't feeling good and hoped for the best. But And do you think, I mean, 1,500 metres above sea level is a fair chunk. Do you think that would be... Yeah, it's, it's just enough. You often hear say people say over 2,000 metres. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So 2,000, you know about it. Mm -hmm. You instantly, if you make a big effort and go into the red, mm -hmm. you just, you suffer. Mm -hmm. 1,500, it's like um, in Val de Soleil, it's similar. Mm. It's just enough to take the edge off. Yeah. So some people are better than others. Some people really feel 1500. Some people doesn't touch the sides. Mm. Um, but I think those guys, if you overexert mm -hmm. and you do a bad lap, mm -hmm. it take, does take longer to recover. You know, you can't just go, oh, I got that wrong. I'll be 20 seconds slower the next lap. You'll be a minute. And we saw Neff do that. And when you have something like Andorra, for instance, you know, they have a good build up to it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. With world champs there last week, I suppose their, their preparation would have been in completely compromised if not at least interrupted yeah they all rock altitude. up yeah so going to medium altitude like that like say with no altitude prep at all mm -hmm. yeah the guys it's a bit of a you know cross your fingers and hope for the best really <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. you've got to ride just that bit smarter yes um, and not make you know Herculean efforts because you're mm -hmm. not going to recover from that mm -hmm. and then we saw so Neff obviously struggled she went out that put Courtney in the driving seat for mm -hmm. the overall yeah. um, and then she was having a hard day I mean she, she dug so she swung off there was five or six guys she was swinging off the back of that mm -hmm. group pulling faces the whole race yeah I mean she's tough because here's the thing you know I think in road cycling well, there was a guy called you know Tommy Vokler famous yeah. famous for the rubber face yeah, yeah 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 I think probably if I was had that many spectators willing me on so much I think I would be rubber facing to my heart's content as yeah. a racer do you think do you think you'd do it yeah I think she think was it, it was advice for her that she, Courtney had that group mm. And she wasn't going, so Neff got it wrong, wrong. Yes. Went too fast and then went slow and had to recover. Courtney rode a better race, but was just struggling. But she mm. just had that group. It was like she was on a bungee cord the whole yes. race. Yeah. And mentally, she had something to hang on yes, to. Yes, that makes sense. I think if it was a hillier course, like an Indora, mm. she would have had an even tougher day mm -hmm. because then you haven't got that motivation to, mm. to cling on to. And then at the front, obviously, they're having a, a right tear up. Yeah. And wasn't it strange, you know, you know, similar in road cycling, it's weird when you see Peter Sagan in his works jersey. Yeah. And it was weird to see Kate Courtney not in the Star Spangled yeah, stripes yeah. and also not in a World Champs version. Yeah, it took me a while to work quite, out who was who. Yeah, it looked quite pe peculiar. Because with, with your teams and with nationalities, how much does that play? I just saw Woodruff looking yeah. behind her shoulder a lot. Do you think that she would have compromised yeah. her race for uh, It can be a real, a real mix-up. So you get some, obviously a team's supposed to look after each other. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a team overall yeah. that they're all fighting for. Um but actually, if it's contract season and you haven't got on with somebody, you might actually look, hope to give your teammate a bit of a kicking, yes. possibly. Yes, yes, I um, you would. Yeah. You could be really good mates with a compatriot. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you spend every national series and every national championships racing with them, mm -hmm. there could be a bit of a grudge match because you mm -hmm. could have been going head to head for the last year. So you might get on with a compatriot mm -hmm. or you could not. Yes, but, with, but when it's a faster race like that, though, there's definitely alliances mm -hmm. within teams or, or teammates or just mates. Mm -hmm. In like just like you would in a road race. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and at that sort of speed, the drafting effect. Does the drafting effect make any difference? Yes, at that speed for sure. At that speed, because you know, when you're coming through the finish straight, I imagine it would. Yeah. But when you see, because I was just watching it, and you know, in the men's race where Nino Shirty essentially 
had a mechanical, yeah, yeah, yeah. went back into it and he fell into the group, fell into the lap of Avancini's teammate. Yeah. But wouldn't somebody sitting right in your wheel, would that be a distraction to you as a racer? Or would it be an encouragement? Yeah, so you, you know? saw it a couple of times. It, was only, it only happened one or two bits. So obviously he went out of the front, shooter punches in the group. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you saw um, Alvesini's teammate Marat mm-hmm. go into the front before a single track. Mm-hmm. And he rode fast enough to not be a complete idiot, mm-hmm. but he didn't try as hard as he could. Mm-hmm. Just And that would have given Alvesini another three seconds. Yes. And there was a bit of that going on. Mm-hmm. Shooter then realised he just had to do it himself yeah. and just gassed it. Absolutely. And, and it know. was an amazing attempt. You could almost, you know, the the... And obviously all these guys are motivated. I'm not reducing anyone saying anyone's unmotivated, but Nino Scherter seemed to have, I wonder if the, the puncture kind of fired him up even more so. I think it does. Yeah, yeah. I think you, and you, you, you have that. They're all, you know, it still amazes me. Those guys are so, you know, pretty ice cool. You know, mm. they come in to get a flat tire. You're supposed to leave it to your mechanics. Mm. And then, but to sit there looking like there's nothing going wrong, have a little drink yeah. while, you know, chaos is happening mm-hmm. and get going again. Yeah, I think you, you, the worst thing is you can actually come out and be going too hard. We said about altitude where mm-hmm. you want to not go into the red. You get back on your bike mm-hmm. and all you want to do is tear the cranks off. Mm-hmm. And actually you have to just get back in your rhythm, yeah. not overexert. And he did a really good job. He got back into the group and you saw him sit in for a lap mm-hmm. just to get himself back in you know, the right place. And then he went for it. Mm-hmm. And then he got some help off Tampier, the French guy. Yeah. Um, he, was, he was riding really strong and that mm-hmm. helped a little bit. But yeah, the other teammates, you definitely saw they were getting in the way a little bit. Yeah. And do you think, you know, like... When, you know, I also think, you know, talking about this slipstreaming. Yeah. When people are going up a climb, it must mean make no difference. Is it just, do you get on the descent? I mean, yeah, you know. so it, in terms of that you know, aerodynamics, below kind of 10 mile an hour, mm. it's negligible, mm. you know, especially on a mountain bike. But on that course, there was quite a lot of parts before and it ramps up. Yes. So you've got those long forest road stretches mm. and those guys would have been doing close to you know, 22, 23. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, wow. Right yeah, yeah. So that, at that point, yeah, you're in a bunch. And that's why you kept seeing it bunching up again, mm-hmm. whereas guys not wanting to commit. Mm-hmm. There was a really good one. We used to race the old Fort William course and it was like a triangle. So mm-hmm. it was generally one big climb up, yeah. one big descent back, and then you had a big forest road to mm-hmm. get back to the arena. And on the forest road, it was always like that. You could get back on. As long as you were close enough at the top of the descent, mm-hmm. you'd get down and then nobody wanted to be the one pushing on the forest road. Mm-hmm. And then you get back into a group. So the first couple laps at Fort William, I remember one year I was riding okay. We had 20 guys mm. after lap one. Wow. And it was the forest road where it all kept regrouping. Yeah. There's a scrap then for the first bit of single track. Mm-hmm. And you basically repeat that. And everyone's scrapping to get into the right place. The front guys, you know, shooter wanted to be at front. And we, we did kind of see that on the first yeah. lap. It meant a bit more tactical because I, you know, I, I read a statistic that the, the women's short track laps opening yeah. laps were faster than the men's yeah, yeah that much you know the tactic and being in the right position as you know i, I personally i think short track's been quite successful yeah i think it's been a really good addition do, as yeah. a do you think you'd have enjoyed racing it yeah i think it's they've the, with mountain bike they've been struggling for a while obviously downhill's got a qualifier yeah which i think is a really cool thing it mm-hmm. makes the weekend longer uh, gives sponsors more coverage mm-hmm. better for the fans that are coming for the weekend and down, cross country's been trying to find us a, a qualifier for a long time mm-hmm. Uh, there was years ago, I'm going to sound like an old guy, but way back, we used to have to do a time trial lap. Oh, no. A whole lap. Oh, no, no. One no. at a time. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> savage. I mean, it's To horrible. grid you for the Sunday. So you yeah. did it on a Friday to grid for a Sunday. That mm-hmm. didn't quite work because it was, it was too, um, too out of control. Mm-hmm. So if you had a mechanical, you were way behind, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so they've come up with this thing, and I think they've got it right now. Yeah. The, you know, it's had a couple of seasons running now, and it's that top 30, race it, mm-hmm. and actually you're saved. The yeah. wish you, a lot of teams have got to mountain bike mechanical is a common place. Mm-hmm. You don't want that guy who's leading the overall yeah. to have to line up 120th and ruin his race. Yeah. So this top 30 thing works, yes. like this kind of shootout. And having this short race Friday night, you get some really good feedback that people are yeah. coming back and It's kind and of it. a, I suppose, and not to disparage forecast at all, but it kind of finally fills the boots. Yeah, it does, yeah. You know, in a way that perhaps was kind of lacking. I think the problem with forecast was it was like, when it was almost, you know, some grey relaxed and not that high consequence. Yeah. But to say to a downhill rider, I want you to do a race on a Friday yeah. that's incredibly dangerous. Yeah, you yeah, could yeah. fall off and not be your fault and you could write off a season. Yeah. Is they're ludicrous. not going to get involved. Yeah, they're not, yeah. not going to be interested. Now this one, it's, it's a cool little format. The racing's good. It doesn't need to be overcomplicated as a circuit. Mm-hmm. 
So as an organiser, they haven't got to create a four-cross circuit. Yes, of course. Yeah. You can just literally bodge it together a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it works really well. Close racing, Friday night, it's not a hard enough effort that, that all the riders, you know, they, you, you can absorb that into your training mm -hmm. plan for the weekend, so that's not a problem. But yeah, no, I think it's working really well. A couple of big jumps that they can include in. And um, yeah, I think it's a success. It'd be interesting to see. I don't know, you know whether it'll end up being a, another Olympic discipline mm. for, for cross-country guys, mm. you know, because, you know, they... They've got an issue with Olympics of getting, um, they can't have any more people because mm -hmm. the Olympics is full, but you can <laughs> yeah. get the same people doing more events. Oh, yes, yeah. So swimming, you know. Yeah, add another one. Add yeah. another one. Out. As long as it's the same group of guys <laughs> yeah. um, and no more people and no more beds. So I, it'd be interesting. I don't know what the plans are. Maybe that's another question. For... And speaking of the Olympics, you know, you heard early on in the season, Machi van der Poel yeah. prioritising Tokyo. I mean, surely a few weekends racing, some bacon sandwiches and a can of lager yeah. isn't going to hurt this far out. Yeah, so his big thing was, I mean, he's exceeded his expectations on the road mm -hmm. this year. So he's, he, I mean, he won a Amstel gold. Yes. For, for the, well, the guys no, who don't know road, that's no, no, about as big as it gets. But he also was his own lead out man for that sprint. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, it was incredible. The watts I think he was on was just yeah. horrific. So he's won cyclocross worlds. Um, I mean, when you look at him as an athlete, um, you know, no one's ever done it before. He wins cyclocross worlds. He then wins a World World Cup mm -hmm. at the biggest level, mm -hmm. and then, but and then he wins a mountain bike World Cup too. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just, it's just bonkers. Mm -hmm. His plan was always to do Tokyo, mm -hmm. and I think that's his best chance of an Olympic goal. And then I thought he'd then go on the road, but mm -hmm. he's because he's done so well on the road this year, he wanted to get. So he's, he's uh, missed the mountain bike worlds mm. to do the road worlds in Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. So that's in I think, two weeks' time. Mm -hmm. So he's now doing, he's actually doing the Tour of Britain road oh, race. Okay, yeah. So that's what he's doing at the moment. So he could have done mountain bike, mountain bike, and then just rocked up to the road worlds. Mm -hmm. But he knows that's not, he's going to do road worlds. He's got a chance of winning the road world championships. So he's decided, right, I need six weeks or you know, seven yeah. weeks. Of, so he did the last World Cup, previous one, mm -hmm. and then he's had a road program. And do you think that will kind of, you know, Nino Schurter is clearly a driven yeah. and uncompromising athlete. Do you think it would kind of irk him somewhat to not be able to beat Matty van der Poel on the track? Yeah, on, on I, the... I think, yeah, he'd want to, him to be at every race. He'd want I think. him to be there. Yeah, yeah. I don't, he's, he's, yeah, he's too much of a competitor. Do you think that that will, you know, I would imagine kind of, it would affect you mentally. And as, Nico, uh, as Nino now builds up for this really important Tokyo year, yeah. And you know, and he's basically, in terms of world champs and one day racing, I, mean, well, I suppose World Cups as well. He has been just the story of the decade, really. He's been absolutely yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Do you think that he'd be going into winter thinking, Oof, I wonder what Matthew van der Poel would have done? Yeah, so the advantage he's got, though, is that he's only thinking of one thing. Mm. Uh, van der Poel at the moment has managed to combine cross, road, and yeah. mountain bike. Um, but that's a risk. He's yeah. doing something that doesn't, that can't be done. Yeah. <laughs> basically yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's doing it so but at some point you know it's not the best way of doing it mm -hmm. if he just did one he would surely be better at that one mm -hmm. just you know even if it's a few percent but that few percent can be so next year he's going to do more road again he's going to do less cross in the winter but he's still racing cyclocross mm -hmm. in the winter so he's trying to spin a lot of plates um and nino's just got one plate to spin mm -hmm. so yeah and with um in terms of you know build up and training I think we saw it in both the downhill and the cross country with uh, Prevo and Nicole. Yeah. Very bad starts to the season. Yeah. You know, but they brought it back. Do you think that racing is the best training? Do you think you can replicate it at home? No. I mean, Zwift? <laughs> no, no, you, you've got, I mean, you've got to, you have to race. You've got to be fit enough to do it, mm. but you can't beat racing. I mean, Zwift's now at Eurobike, they had it with the, um, with the, the steering. I've seen, yeah, I saw that, yeah, yeah. So, I mean... I mean, it's great, and then, now there's no reason to ride bikes outside. It's it's let's just do all all online. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> a little rumble strip as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we're cool. But I think you can do so much. But it's think that what racing does is it gives it pulls you out when you think you're done. Mm -hmm. You have to go that next bit, mm -hmm. and when you're training, you can train to your numbers mm -hmm. and be on your power meter or on your turbo or whatever. But nobody then comes in at the last ten seconds of your interval mm -hmm. and sticks a half wheel on you, and you mm -hmm. have to go again. Yeah. I mean, we used to. That's why a lot of uh, uh, as cross country is is you struggle to recover from it, mm -hmm. so you, it's hard to build form through cross country racing. Mm -hmm. You need some, but if you do too much, it's too fatiguing. Mm -hmm. But that's why a lot of cross country riders will race on the road, yes. so you can get that racing and that physical effort, but mm -hmm. without the the beating. Yes. Um, so you can. Yeah, I mean, you you can't beat racing. You've got to do it. And do you ride 
you know, in that in that sort of sequence, I think of Avancini out on the front. Yeah. You know, he seemed to have it. You know, it had fallen into his lap. This potential win. He would have preferred Shooter to stay with him. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that would would he been off the power meter? Yeah, I mean, most as, though, as a racer, most you... quite a lot of those guys are still running power now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I f- I would guess they're not using it so much when they're in the race. Mm-hmm. It's more of a research afterwards. Yeah, I suppose it's probably of limited use to you if you're being overtaken and you're shouting, but I'm doing 500 watts! <laughs> yeah, I'm you're doing in. it for minutes, it doesn't make sense! Yeah, well, if you're so dropped, you're we, we, you know, we, before power meters, on, we used to have heart rate monitors and you'd have a look at it afterwards. Mm. But when you're doing it, you're doing it. You know, in that mm-hmm. race, you're either... And you've got... You've, you're doing it, you've done it so many years and so many times, mm-hmm. you've got a sense of pacing. Yes. And you know whether you are, whether the pace you're on is achievable for your hour and a half or not. Mm. And sometimes you mess it up, but normally yeah. you're all right. I reckon sometimes, long climb you could, so say it was a, an Andori sort of race with the big long climbs, mm. I think then you could have a look at it. But something like the, the race on the weekend where it's so intense, mm-hmm. you know, forest track, little kicks up, little yes. descents, you've just got to rev and rip, I think. Yeah, totally. And I think... Um, you know, with that sort of, that culture of this is what I have to do to stay with it. Yeah. I think actually that's kind of more coming over to downhill. I see, I feel now we've got a crop of racers, your Brunies, your Pirions, and if you said at the top, you've got to do a 403, yeah. they could almost do it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, they yeah, seem yeah. to be, I remember hearing an interview with Loic after, I believe it was Andorra, and he had heard the time at the top because of the pits were at the top there. Yeah. And he, you know, they had a TV and the speaker. And he just said to himself, okay, and this, you know, and kind of a, to paraphrase him, he said, well, I'm just going to have to be scared because that's the time I've got to do now. Yeah, they know, you know? what, they know where those bits are if they need yeah. it. Yeah, and I would love to see if, if there's a way we could get, and there's a lot of telemetry and things going on downhill. I would love to see if we could get more metrics. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I think it could be really useful. And as, as a mechanic, I mean, stuff like that is, I, I, that's, that's the, you know, it's called puzzling now, which is a bit of a buzzword, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's so satisfying sitting at the bottom of gondola with a cup of tea and maybe a breakfast muffin yeah. and being like they go do a run and you think oh this is this is what needs to be done yeah and then you think and you talk about balance and all that sort of thing and i suppose it's moving away from just feel and now we do have all these new metrics and this telemetry yeah. although enormously expensive do you think there's a place for telemetry on cross-country bikes well i know that guys are doing more testing i'm away from the cross-country scene now but we were starting to do I've stopped racing properly seven years ago, mm. but when just then we were starting to do more. Mm. So we had timing sections, not so much on the bike, but more small timing posts. So you mm. had, you know, a watch, which you, you could put posts Free on. Free lap it. or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and little pods down the course. So you could even go in, you know, you could work out speeds in and out of a section. Mm. Um, you've got power meters on bikes for cross country. Um, and it's trying to work out. So a lot more research onto tyres. Mm. Um, but mountain biking is traditionally really difficult because of the changing conditions you know yeah. so it's when i was on the national team you're you're looking at trying to develop kit for mountain bikes compared to someone trying to develop kit for track riding in the velodrome mm. now you know a velodrome on one day is going to be pretty similar on mm. another day and you can even adjust for air pressure and work out the equation yes. what you can't work out is well that route was a little bit wetter that day mm. and the dirt's a little bit stickier do it's you, a hard one to do do you not find it strange and this is maybe i think it's probably more indicative of funds in mountain biking and the available resources but say at the top of a downhill world cup run or indeed a cross country run we look at um tread patterns yeah in terms of how they will penetrate the dirt yeah and if they will clog up yeah that's kind of largely it yeah or how you know on how they'll how they'll basically grip the terrain but providing those two criteria are satisfied yeah we run the same compound in the wet as we do in the dry yeah doesn't yeah. that smack of like a bit of they wouldn't do that in formula one no, no. They wouldn't be like, oh, it's bloody good in the dry, that. Yeah. Yeah, the tyre's not going to clog up. Yeah, it'll be all right. You know, like when Aaron Gwynn, and that's speaking to Chris Porton, he made the point, the fact that Aaron Gwynn, a couple of years ago at Mont saint Anne, could inside those last turns yeah. in a deluge of rain, well, he's probably the tyres aren't soft enough in the dry then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, It's yeah, yeah. It's a really, sorry, they're, they're probably, you know, I'm not saying we don't, we have different, I think it'd be cool to get different compounds in yeah. both well, I had one year. You know, I'm not naming the sponsor. We, we had one oh, year. I love the scoops. We had one year the where bus. we had. We, they didn't. They they were they, they they sponsored the team, mm-hmm. but they didn't do. They weren't really investing in mountain bike tires, mm-hmm. um, and we had cheaper tires mm-hmm. to run with. You know, so instead of running the better compound kind of what would retail at kind of sixty quid, mm-hmm. we were running tires racing on World Cups on tires that were probably retailing at about thirty five quid. Mm-hmm. 
and they were all right but you get anywhere near any rocks or mm. roots oh my god i can believe it yeah, yeah. we've all ridden a crappy mountain bike tire mm. but the difference was night and day yes and that was just over tire quality never mind then getting the best tires mm. and having different tread on brand yeah and i would love to see you know this is probably just me and it's not necessarily a serious suggestion but the way the world cups is going you know they're kind of looking at reducing the field size of the field and downhill right and you know making it kind of more spectator friendly etc cetera, etc cetera. and i would love it see to get to a point where maybe and like i said this isn't necessarily a serious suggestion but maybe there was say 50 to 60 world cup riders yeah and the series they say you just race the series because why would you race anything else? There are yeah. 11 rounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the series tyre sponsor because I think you can have a fantastic bike and you can have fantastic geometry and the best suspension technician if your tyres don't grip. Yeah, yeah. And there are some companies, you know, like, like you said, there are some companies that sadly make, don't make very good tyres. In certain and conditions, it, yeah, I wasn't competitive. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's oh, I can believe it. Yeah. You know, and you know, you see so many, if you look at the tread pattern, I suppose the thing that what it says on the side, you know, teams are constantly having to black out. And, you know, it's a very difficult relationship with the tyre sponsor then. I think it'd be so nice to see, you know, this is the series tyre sponsor. Everyone gets a fair share of the money, depending on, you know, like where your standings are roughly. And this is the tyres. Because then people will be like, oh, okay, well, that's one thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would kind of be, I just think you could, like I said, you could get the best bike with the best rider, put them on some bad tyres. And everything else, the the whole all the other inputs are playing catch up to the bad information being fed back to the rider by the tire. Mm. Because if your tire doesn't grip, what can you, what can you do? Be interesting. And, um, and I heard, and I would love to try, though I, I never did. It was something on my to-do list with RC tires and softening compounds. Cause for yeah. those little things, they, they put stuff on to degrade the rubber slightly. Right. And I think, you know, I know this probably isn't an environmentally nice view to have, but for a downhill tire, you should only get five runs out of it for a World Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be that soft. It should be like, whew, you know, this isn't even consumer friendly. We've made you something a bit extra special here because it wouldn't last. And I know there's a lot of things about support. You know, I, I heard a few years ago, um, it's actually quite a big brand went to a new compound and all the races were having to run the harder compound, which was the cheap one, because they had so much flex in the chassis of the tire yeah, stand on the side knobs, you know. Yeah. So it's probably not as simple as I, I mean, it wasn't out, too long ago, so... It was only a couple of years ago, but Nino, well, the Scott team and Nino were running tubular. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, so they were yeah. running tubular, so stick on the rim tyres, mm. like on a you know, high-end road bike. They were still running those. That was only a, up to a few years ago mm. when he swapped over and Maxis became involved with those guys. But um, they were using tubular. Mm. And those tyres are, the advantage of those is they're so soft yes, or pliable. They so they're, they're, a, they're, they're a silk casing, mm. you know, and, and then they will absorb around anything. Mm. Um, but that was specific rims, specific tyres, yeah. you know. Changing a tyre is, you know, not an option. They turn up with a, you know, a van full of wheels. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, really full on. Yeah, we used to glue the tyres onto the rim. Yeah. Which meant that the rim was sadly toast. Yeah, I've afterwards. heard of that one. Remember, yeah. Which is, well, you, you can get it off eventually. I've heard of Danny Hart coming down and they literally, Dave Garland taking a rim, you know, rebuilding rims every, every lap at Fort mm. William because yeah. the tyres are glued on and he's just denting rims. and Yeah. It's just, just a pile of empty rims at the end of the weekend. Yes, totally. And do you think, um, you know, with with this whole, I mean, a fad wouldn't be a, the fashion of tyre inserts. Yeah. Would you be interested in taking a slight weight penalty? Yeah, I heard some people yeah. running them at, um, I think I saw, read some of the, you know, it was a bike analysis from Kate Courtney's bike and mm -hmm. she was running one in the back oh, really? um, in, in Mont saint at the Worlds. Mm -hmm. Um, don't know if Nino was running one. I don't know. But yeah. Someone might help, might you know might know about that one. But yeah, but running an insert in the back mm -hmm. just to take the edge off in because they were trying to run those guys in particular are running wider tires this year than yes. average and low pressures. I've heard really as well. low pressures. Mm -hmm. You know, 16, 17 psi. Well, that's basically just coughing through the valve. I think. Yeah. Just put, put the insert back in. Yeah. And two, <laughs> and, and two point three, two point four tires, mm -hmm. which you know is is really wide for XC. I mean, mm -hmm. XC is generally running off two inch. Then two point two got a bit more popular, mm -hmm. and they've gone another notch. Yeah, and they've both won the World Cup, so yeah. But there is a lot more data with this now, and um, coming from the, yeah the roadside and, and the footprint of the tire, and whether you want it to be long and parallel to yeah. the direction of travel, or you know wider and sort of stouter, yeah, yeah, and you know which is actually faster rolling. But coming back to what you said, I wonder, you know, there must be so many variables. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder if you know you say to Mister 
however many world champs he's won now, Nina Scherter. Yeah. Oh, we've got the Dayton. This tire's quicker. Oh, if he's like, oh, no. I, I are you, he, he, he invested in equipment. Mm. He's on it, that boy. Mm. Yeah, so he's, um, he'll know, you know, he doesn't run a drop a post at the moment, mm. that he's worked that out. Mm. You know, he hasn't just made a call on that one. He, he, he will have, he'll know the facts behind that order for. And that Scott Sram team. Yes. I mean, is dominance a fair word? They didn't, they didn't, interesting enough, they didn't win the UCI team ranking. No, so Cannondale got that one. Cannondale. And it was did. close. It so was. Hence close. why that was another aspect of the weekend. We saw the, yeah. the final group had two Scots. So the, the team race for cross country is your top three riders from mm-hmm. the team added together for each race mm-hmm. and then overall. Um, and then in the last, in the, that last lap, there was three Cannondales, mm-hmm. two Scots. Yeah. Um, and the manager's son, Thomas Frischneck, who's a complete legend, his son Andre rides for the team. He was the third counter Ooh. who wasn't having, he was having a, still a good no. day, but not the best. He was sitting in about 20th. Yeah, no pocket money for him. <laughs> not this week. <laughs> but no, he still did a good ride, but he's the third counter. Yeah. And then, yeah, Cannondale had all three guys mm-hmm. in that front group. So they smashed the overall out. Yes. Um, which is a big, a big award. Yeah, totally. I think it would definitely go some way to substantiate claims about bike performance. Yeah. When they say, oh, you know, you only want a lefty. Yeah. Look. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's the only World Cup overall I ever won was part of the team. So (laughs) so I'll tell them, take it. (laughs) (laughs) Because, you know, something I was thinking about, I was actually, I was thinking about it in World Champs and they were talking about um, French dominance. Yeah. You know, the cross country women's, the cross country uh, downhill in terms of... And men's, you know, don't have to go too long ago. Um, you had you know, Julian Absalom, mm-hmm. who still got the one up on shooter on the number yeah. of World Cups run. But just in terms of that nation thing and, and looking at the the field of players is currently, yeah. And I would say yes, the, there is a French dominance. However, the other common denominator with those athletes is they're Red Bull athletes. Yes. If we talked about Red Bull as a nation, <laughs> which I'm doing very tentatively, yeah. But yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. So Lars Forster. Yes. He's a Red Bull athlete. So he won, he's a Scott rider, mm-hmm. but won the cross country World Cups. They won both mm. cross countries, the women's overall, yep. <laughs> men's overall. Yeah. Because do you think there's, do you think that's a case of them being big enough to buy the best talent? I remember when a couple of years ago, there's a real emphasis on getting young guys, signing people when they were, you know, still in juniors and developing them. But yeah. now maybe Martin Mace would be an example, although he is still very young. Yeah. He's obviously had a huge amount of acclaim before that. Richie Rude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just, oh, put a head, yeah, head so I, I, I knew bits and bobs, and I think when, when they were saying they used to put quite a lot into the the background of it. Mm-hmm. So if you're a Red Bull athlete, you had access to psychologists, mm-hmm. strength training, et cetera, that was available as well, wasn't it, to mm-hmm. try and help you. You yes. didn't just get the cash and the helmet. Yeah. You got some extra support. Yes. Um, I don't know how, I don't know what the current deal is with those guys, but they do seem to be now just going, right, he's winning. I, I know they have houses around the place, like in various resort towns and stuff, and they, you get free. You might and have you to just, live with yeah, some ragtag BMXer train. who, you know, just wants to do ollies and kickflips, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But you do get free accommodation. So you can go to, say, Queenstown or wherever. Yeah, so you're accessing the support oh, yeah. network with those guys, yeah. Because um, the the other thing, I suppose, and this is, you know, a bit of a, bit of a kind of gossipy sort of... Okay. But I have heard of people being said... I say Red Bull to Monster or vice versa. Yeah. If you don't, you don't have to sign with us, but if you refuse that other energy drinks contract, we'll pay you the same amount. You know, apparently it's quite big in motocross. Okay. Then just like, we don't want another Red Bull athlete on the, say Monster saying, we don't want another Red Bull athlete on the podium, yeah. but for whatever reason, he's not going to sign for us because this XYZ, yeah, yeah. we will pay you off not to sign. They are that, in that heated rivalry with one another. But interestingly, Monster hasn't come across to the cross country side, or has it? I can't think of any. No, I don't think so. No, no, I, I don't know an athlete that's on. They're the a bit kind of cooler, then less. Yeah, yeah, Red Bulls just, you know, it, yeah. No, I don't. I don't think it's quite their market. They might, yeah, no. Yeah, they totally. don't. They don't. They don't advertise it in the same way. So that's yeah. probably where they're putting their cash. I mean, they're putting. You know, clearly the, the Red Bull cross country athletes is a big deal. So I mean, I'm just surprised at how much money these companies have. I mean, I wouldn't have thought, you know, drain cleaner would be that lucrative but it is <laughs> yeah, it is yeah. they're making whoa, coca-cola as well another big one <laughs> yeah but they're they're, re- they're really smart in the fact that yeah it's a, it's a very smart company very well marketed but they it's the fact they they do the helmet mm. i mean that's bloody brilliant what bit do you when so someone crosses a finish line so all race Lars foster's leaning over mm-hmm. and um you can't see his jersey yes so you can't see scott you couldn't see maxis mm. but you can see his helmet mm. all race 
And when he's on the podium at the end, and it's just like, I think a lot of sport sponsors, they're actually getting a deal. Yes. So I don't know what the comparison is or how much he gets compared to his other contract, but you always see the Red Bull bit mm. and you don't necessarily see the, the team bit. Well, it's the, and that's something that is a bit of a pet hate of mine. On the downhill jerseys, they have the name across the shoulders. Yeah. And when somebody's standing up straight, it looks fantastic, like, you know, like a football yeah, show yeah. or something. But when somebody's riding a bike, looking from them behind, you can never see their name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is so annoying. Put it at the bottom. Yeah. You know? But, but they're, they're, they're smart guys. Yeah, totally. And I think what's, you know, we're talking about that. If we, you know, if we treat Red Bull sort of as a nation. As your nation. As a nation, <laughs> which, you know, it's, it's probably quite dangerous territory. You were obviously part of the British cycling setup. Yeah, yeah. How much, was that sort of, a, did, could you ring up the head of British cycling and say, listen, my factory team is great. However, I need X, Y, Z. They can't provide it. Would, would there that sort of support? Yeah. Be there? So when we did it, to, so as a if you're in a commercial, you're, you're so with the way that British cycling set, you're either on, the, you're in the team, and then mm-hmm. you get support. But you have a, if you've got a professional sponsor, mm-hmm. then that's different. You, they, 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 they then become the support network for it. And did you did you personally have any kind of dealings with Daddy Dale, Dave Brailsford? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Was, was yeah. It, what was he like to deal with? You know, was it? Yeah, he's a good lad. He's a good lad. Yeah, no, he's, he's very straight. And um, I was an annoying athlete for him or for national team because I'm not a wed- I'm not a winner. Yeah. I was never a winner. I was a, I was a top ten guy, which is annoying for federations, especially British cycling, because it's about medals. Mm-hmm. That's what it's all. It's a medal winning factory. Um, so for someone like me, it's annoying because I was too good enough to anno- ignore, <laughs> but right. but actually wasn't going to give them very much back. Well, that's probably very modest of you, but I yeah. get what you're saying. So, yeah. so I, I won a, a Commonwealth silver. So mm-hmm. I gave them something. Mm-hmm. But when you look at the investment they put in over X amount mm-hmm. of years, you know, if you add that up in cash and said, I'll give you a Commonwealth Games silver mm-hmm. for that money. But he, he seemed to have taken on the kind of, you know, he, but I, I feel Dave Brailsford has become the Oprah Winfrey of road cycling. Just like, <laughs> you get a Tour de France, you get a Vuelta a Espana, you get a world, you know, he just gives oh. them away. <laughs> what he's achieved is is very impressive. Yeah, he's, he's a great is. guy, he's a good businessman. He's great with managing people. Mm-hmm. And the nice thing about I always got on with him because he was straight, straight than night. Yeah. You know, I've sat down, I've had, me- you know, we'd have annual meetings. We'd mm-hmm. see him at races as well. He's always, you know, he's hands on. Yeah. And it's, you know, this is what I think. What do you think? Yes. You know, and um, I, I, I came and went from the national team a few mm-hmm. times um, because I wasn't going to necessarily give them what they wanted. Mm-hmm. Then another Olympics would come around and go, oh, bloody hell, we got to follow that. <laughs> Wheel him out, boys. Wheel him out. Oh, God, we, we've not got anyone better yet. But, but you know, and, and then afterwards they'd say, right, you know, in four years' time, you're going to give me a medal yet? And I'd be like, nope. It sounds like the, the premise of some kind of, you know, Hollywood movie, one last heist. Well, you know? one, I was always one last. And eventually just said, look, like, you're done. You, know, you, you are done. Well, um, I feel we've wrapped things up quite nicely there. Yeah, with, uh, those last we're, couple of yeah, words. Abusing we my cycling done. career. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Cool. Cheers. I hope it's been uh, some informative and good listening for those at home and only apologies if it's not if it hasn't been well done for getting this far for sticking with it and grimacing through. it's good endurance <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell if you're watching on YouTube and also you can get this all over the place and thank you for listening on one of the other platforms if you do so see you next week thank you very much cheers thank you